it's quite a secret. Just to say briefly on that. Still around. Yeah. And what are you doing? Director of Strategy and Policy in the workforce for NAC, because I work for the VRF. Oh, right. Oh, it does need some Oh, yeah. It's a workforce plan. No, it's a strategy. No, it's good. It's good. I'm very involved in talking to people about developing that. I'm just looking at it. I'm actually thinking of doing it. I'm just looking at it. I'm just looking at it. I'm just looking at it. What are the problems of doing it? How do you make it happen? And some of it is beyond the health sector. Let me ask him. Well, it's 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 Hi. Good morning, everyone. Morning. I think we'll make a start now. Um, so welcome to you all. Welcome to the King's Fund. I'm Sarah Walno, the Chief Executive, uh, relatively new in post. Um, I've done a couple of months. Very happy to be here. Um, and welcome to people both in the room. Uh, we're also live streaming this event. So uh, welcome to all who could make it. Uh, I've got a couple of housekeeping before we get into um, the agenda this morning. There's no planned fire alarm, so if it goes off, it's for real. Uh, our media, social media hashtag is hashtag KF Care Closer to Home, so please do uh, use that as the discussion goes along. 
Uh, we will be recording the session and sharing it afterwards with attendees and those on the invite list um, who were unable to join us. Um, so a reminder that all contributions are on the record and we have certainly um, invited or, or we, we believe some media um, reps will be joining us today. Having said that, uh, we hope, of course, we'll have a lively, open, uh, really frank conversation this morning. So welcome uh, to this breakfast, Making Care Closer to Home a Reality, which talks to the report that was published last week. Uh, this is the third breakfast in a pre-election series that the King's Fund is hosting. And as I say, this event pub um, focuses on the report we published last week. Um, it feels really resonant to me joining the King's Fund, but coming from um, most recently a national respiratory charity where the most common theme raised on the helpline and by beneficiaries was struggling to access primary care or feeling as though they were ending up in secondary tertiary care uh, because their care wasn't managed perhaps as, as, as well as it might um, upstream. What we know is that people are living longer with multiple complex long-term conditions but are often struggling to access primary care, social care and community-based services they need to manage their conditions. This means they may not receive treatment until their needs are more serious. Not only does this put increasing pressure on hospitals already struggling to be as productive as they were before the pandemic, it can be worse for people's health and more expensive for the taxpayer. Action is needed to enable more people to access care in their community so that they can stay healthier for longer. Um, this, I think, is very well known um, uh, and something <coughs> that the system has been grappling with and struggling with. So why did we do the work? Um, well, you're going to hear from the report authors and then we've got a fantastic panel to comment before we come out for a Q&A. But I think the fundamental premise is we have collectively known this as a system for decades and yet we have struggled to make the shift. And so what our report authors have done is gone out and spoken to many parts of the system. They've analysed evidence and, and research to try to understand, even though there's a lot of consensus that we know we've needed to shift or we do need to shift more care out of the hospital setting, it hasn't happened. So why and what can we do about it? Uh, I'm not going to say any more now. I'm going to hand over to the project team who produced the report um, and they're going to talk you through high-level findings. Uh, then I'm going to introduce our, our um, panellists and then we'll open to a Q&A. That's how uh, the event will run uh, and I'll have to keep everyone to time because we're out of here at 9.45. So I'll do a very short introduction, but to say that our, our project team consists of Becky Baird, our senior uh, fellow in policy, Deborah Fenney, uh, a policy fellow, Danielle Jeffries, a senior analyst, and Andy Brooks, a senior visiting fellow. And I think, uh, actually, I don't know who's going to kick off, but we're looking, Deborah, Deborah, we're looking forward to hearing um, what the report said, what you found. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sarah. And so thank you for kind of setting the, the broad context for this piece of work. What I'm here to do this morning is really simply talk to you about um, what we did and who we spoke to, because uh, to set the context for this work, it's really important to understand what it is and also a bit about what it's not. So as Sarah's already set out, this piece of work was to understand why this shift hasn't happened, what the particular barriers are to it, and think about some of the ways forward. It's not kind of going into the granular depths of what those particular things might be, but it's that broad overall context of, of where the opportunities lie. And this was a fairly short piece of work. So we started scoping it in May last year, and we were really lucky to be able to use both our King's Fund General Advisory Council to help us with some early conversations about the work. And then we also convened a specific project advisory group to help us kind of dig into deep into how and the particular questions we were going to ask. Then our evidence gathering phase, this again, uh, June to August, you can see this was quite quick. Um, there was quantitative data analysis, which Danielle's going to talk to you about shortly. 
uh, we undertook a lot of literature reviewing of the existing evidence and quality of interviews with people who had worked across the system in different capacities and uh, people with lived experience of using health and care services. And then, and I think a really key part of this work as well was our engagement and challenge. And we undertook this with the kind of evidence that we'd gathered and we held themed workshops on particular aspects that we wanted to learn more about. We again used our project advisory group to help us with this and we were extremely lucky to get a second dip into the general advisory council and uh, their thoughts really helped to shape the work. And then finally peer review with colleagues both inside and outside of the fund. So it feels like uh, quite a lot <coughs> that we did in quite a short period of time. And then second, who we talked with, because I think this is something that people ask us a lot. So really just to give you a flavour of this, I'm not going to read out every bullet point here, but um, we spoke to national leaders, civil servants, politicians, arms and bodies, patient leaders. And I think it's really important to say that we did explicitly include people with lived experience of using health and care services to help us understand the context and what's important about this work practitioner leaders and again we went beyond health and care to therapies and social work as well as medical and nursing provider leaders across the different sectors including voluntary and community sector and system leaders um i can't remember if there's a third one there but integrated care system and local <laughs> authority but the, the point of this is to say that this was a piece where we tried to engage as widely as possible to get as much um breadth of perspectives on what the barriers have been and what those ways forward might be. And with that, um. thanks, Deborah. So I'm going to give a couple of highlights of the data analysis, which formed part of that evidence gathering phase of this project. Um, and we looked at data for both NHS and social care across workforce, funding, finance, activity. And in general, what we found is that, that all the evidence and the data points towards care not yet moving towards closer to home. So to give you a couple of examples, there was one more. <laughs> um, so if we start with activity across the NHS, um, so we already know that the majority of activity across the NHS already happens in primary and community care. So this um, chart shows you the daily activity across different sectors. You can see here a huge amount of daily activity happens in uh, general practice appointments and in community health contacts. So we already know there is a lot of activity happening in this area. However, when, when we think about the fact that demand for a lot of these services is growing, demand for health, demand for care is growing, what we're not seeing is um, resources and uh, funding, finance, workforce growing in these areas. So to give you an example, if we look at uh, the funding and finance growth over the last five years, this is the growth in um, funding towards different types of NHS trusts over the last five years. And you can see very clearly, both in absolute and relative terms, all of that growth is, most of that growth is going towards the acute sector. And very little is going towards that community sector. So really highlighting that we're not yet moving care closer to home. And we've not yet seen that in the funding move, movements and growth, and we've not yet seen that in the workforce either. So that's just a quick overview. I'm now handing over to Becky to give you an overview of some of our findings. Thank you very much. So... We really wanted to understand why this shift, why this shift in focus hasn't happened. We've all talked about it for a long time. I picked 30 years because that's how long I've been at this. Um, and we've certainly been talking about this for as long as I've ever worked in the NHS and social care. What we found was a range of reasons, and I'll, I'll just talk you through them briefly. We have misplaced assumptions that this will save money in the short term, and it's not going to. Delivering care is all about the cost of staff. And that's the same whether you're in a hospital or out of a hospital. It's the fixed costs in hospitals that make them expensive. And unless you can close that hospital estate, as perhaps we did when we closed mental health asylums back in the 80s and 90s, you can't extract that money. And, and we are underbedded as a country. We have less beds per capita than other uh, comparable countries. So this is not a, something that's going to generate immediate cost savings. What it will do is prevent the need to build ever more hospitals which are very expensive so it's a it's a long-term counterfactual rather than a short-term saving we discovered this what we call the cycle of invisibility is data in this area is very hard to quantify and understand it's it's amorphous it's often based around qualitative and experiential data as uh, it's much easier to count things often in hospitals and activity 
And that cycle of invisibility means we don't really see what's going on, so we don't know what's going on, so we don't tend to make decisions about it, which means we don't invest in collecting better data, so it kind of goes around, added to which a lot of the senior leadership within health and care, but particularly in the NHS, has come from an acute sector background. Um, we privilege working in large teaching hospitals, and that seems to have added to the sense that we don't have a lot of people with a lot of experience of primary and community care in very senior leadership positions. We looked into hierarchies of care. It's much easier to say, well, we've got to focus on the very sick. We've got to focus on ambulances and the emergency stuff. And you can see why that happens. But it means that we, it's much easier to take money out of well-being services. When money needs to be saved, it's much easier to extract it from things that don't seem so critical and urgent. And we don't prioritize some of those things in the same that way that we do life-saving care for lots of different reasons. We really looked into what the public thought, because there's this a perception, and, and certainly elections have been lost on the closure of an A&E department. We know this. But we found that when you dip into that data in more detail, actually, the public really care about primary care services. They don't want to go to hospital. The patient charities, Health Watch England, incredibly helpful national voice, is very clear to us. Patients really care about this stuff. And when you work in a really deliberative way and listen to communities and work with them, actually they do want to move and you can change uh, public perception around what their priorities might be. So a sort of sense that the public won't tolerate any move away from hospital is not necessarily true. We have a financial architecture that just doesn't support the focus on primary, primary and community health care. The legacies of payment by results, for example, which drove activity and drove lots of improvement in waiting times, meant that community and primary care services lost out. The way in which hospital finances are constructed <coughs> makes it very hard to extract cash in any way, even if we're going to move bits of services. We have very short-term approaches to return on investment. We want to see change very quickly. So, uh, and, and often we want to think about that change in relation to hospitals. So have we prevented people going into hospital? Have we made them come out of hospital quicker? What, are we, what is this new service doing to protect hospitals? As opposed to, what is this doing to improve the quality of care for the people experiencing it? We found a system not really set up to deal with the complexity of people's needs today. We have very single <laughs> pathway systems. We look at subspecialisation, specialist care, whereas actually the majority of people are on multiple pathways, have multiple things going on for them often can be a full-time job just trying to juggle all the different bits of appointments and we don't knit it together very well. We don't necessarily train our workforce in a way that they need for the future to work in a more uh, a setting which needs to work in a more generalist way and to think about working in multidisciplinary teams. So we've talked a lot about that workforce and Andy, uh, my colleague, led a lot of our work on what this means for practitioners in the way they need to practice. And finally, this was a really important point, that we have policies and strategies not aligned with the vision. We have a very clear vision about care delivered closer to home, not just in this country, right the way internationally, we're all very clear this is what we need to do. And yet, our policies around performance management focus entirely on hospitals. We don't hold ICSs to account for how well they've done in delivering primary and community care services. We hold them to account for what they're doing around hospital and acute-based care. This is a quick whistle-stop tour. This is a very long report. <laughs> Please do feel free to dive in for the detail, but essentially this is why we think it happened. So what do we do? What needs to happen? And this top point for me is the most important. It needs a total change in focus, and that must come from national level. This will not happen in piecemeal form. This is not about finding that one little policy that will suddenly unlock change and will refocus. This is about the entire focus, and you'll see some of our graphics around the place that we've been using as spotlight, that we want to shift that spotlight from the hospital to primary and community care and keep it there. We think we need to be very clear about why we need to do that. This is not about extracting money now and being cheaper now. This is for the future. This is to ensure a sustainable health and care system that delivers better quality care for people close to where they live and prevents the need for ever more expensive hospitals to be built. We need to align policies behind the vision. If we're going to say that we want to focus on primary community care services, the health system looks up. It will do what it's told to do and there is a limit to how much it can do. So if we tell the health and care system to focus on hospital, that we're going to performance around hospital waiting times, that's what it will do. 
we need to think about how we shift that focus. We need to maintain the vision, as I've said. We don't think this is a necessarily, and we don't think this is about extracting money from hospitals. Hospitals are struggling and we're underbedded. This is about differential funding growth. This is about where we put new money, where we think about funding for the future. We do need to think, to, to think about how we equip the workforce to work in this way. The nature of risk is really different working in the community. Um, we heard from practitioners that there was a sense that either working in the community was a really easy thing to do that you do at the end of your career so you can go and have cups of tea, or that it was a really risky thing to do because you're on your own and you absolutely couldn't do that if you were newly qualified. You'd need lots of experience in the hospital first. So how do we make working in the community a high status profession it definitely used to be how do we how do we improve the status of working in the community how do we make sure the workforce is equipped to manage the risk that it needs to working in that way and to work in multidisciplinary teams and the final point there is about devolving responsibility if we're talking about primary and community services we're talking about place and local and it will be different the solutions will look different they will need to look different the it will need to look different in different parts of the country. So there's something about allowing ICSs to do what they were set up to do, to really think about population health, to really think about how they're going to work in place. Um, <coughs> and that probably needs to happen at every level of the system. So the change in focus at national level, but then devolving the responsibility for action down. And then finally, we talked about what shouldn't happen, which almost for me is more important than what should happen. <coughs> Partial implementation will not solve this. We've got endless examples of brilliant practice, of great care in the community, really good services, but we still haven't made that overall shift. It needs the total change in focus. We can't just pick off small pieces. We also don't, I, we don't believe as authors, we need structural reorganisation to do this. Organisations don't need to come together. We can make the organisations work. We think we, the ICS is are probably as good as we're going to get in terms of structures if they're allowed to get on and do what the ICSs were set up to do. And even at more local level, this is not necessarily about big organisational integration, vertical integration across different services. We just need operational integration so that teams are able to flow across boundaries. We found some really great examples of integrator roles whose job it was just to smooth those pathways, to sort out what the problem was and worry about who was going to pay for it later. To make those systems happen, we can do that without necessarily... Structural reorganisation has never really seemed to solve anything in the NHS, so let's not do any more. And what shouldn't happen is that we will not make short-term financial savings doing this. It's the right thing to do for the longer term, but we're not going to be able to extract savings quickly. That was an extremely fast whistle stop through, through what is a very complicated report, possibly one of the hardest I've ever had to write because it is so complex, it's so interrelated. But this sense that we need a total shift in focus is what we were really, really hoping to get uh, the message across in this meeting. It would be really great to hear from our uh, panellists about, about our report. Lovely. Thank you very much, Becky and team. Um, we are lucky to have two fantastic panellists um, who I'm going to turn to now. Um, so Lord Bethel, a Conservative member of the House <coughs> of Lords and a former Health Minister through the pandemic, um, uh, I will come to you first, but I'm also, to save time... Yeah, oh, Paul should go first. Fine. OK, lovely. Yeah, uh, in which case, Paul Corrigan, who has um, had a number of different careers in health and a social policy <coughs> academic uh, by background, but um, particularly pertinent to, to this breakfast meeting was his stint as a special advisor to successive health secretaries and the prime minister uh, in the new Labour years, 2001 to 2007 ish. <laughs> so, um, welcome, Paul. Welcome, um, Lord Bethel. Paul, over to you first. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, what I want to do is sort of add to uh, the report. Uh, and unusually, I'm going to do that by uh, depending on another King Fund report. Uh, and in December 2022, the King Fund issued a report called Strategies. Uh, to bring down waiting time. Uh, and what was extraordinarily odd about being asked to talk at that report is it suggested I'd been involved in something that worked. Uh, and that's never happened to me before. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but that you come along and you talk to people about something that works. So I'm, I'm, I'm never going to let that experience go. Uh, and that's why today what I want to do is run through 
some of that because what's important about that, seriously, is the King's Fund did an analysis of a refocus, as this report's talking about, in 2001 onwards. Uh, and, and it talks about, and this is what I'm going to talk about, the mechanics of how you do that refocus, rather than simply, in a sense, focusing does appear sometimes as if it's just an act of will. Um, and I don't think acts of will change an organisation the size of a National Health Service. I think you need some mechanics of change. Um, uh, and so uh, one, of the, one of the things that, uh, uh, that the authors have said uh, is there's something very odd about a policy that's definitely been powerfully there since 2014, since the uh, 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 five-year board view, um, uh, a, a policy which almost everybody would agree is the right policy and consistently doesn't happen. Now, that, there is something quite important about that, and I'm afraid the thing I need to say to the King's Fund and to all of us is this demonstrates the feebleness of policy. If you want to change the National Health Service, policy is very important. What's important is the implementation of those policies and the mechanics of those policies. And so underneath a lot of the things that were there, well, you, you've got to make the policies congruent with this focus. You've got to make the practice congruent with the focus. Uh, and how we, how, we, how we talk about that as a essentially a policy community, I think, has to shift um, uh, if we want to do these big changes. Uh, so uh, starting off with, with the issue of focus, and this is where I would say this wouldn't I, whilst I think policy uh, is feeble, politics isn't. Uh, uh, and the analysis that the King's Fund did of, uh, of of focusing on waiting times starts with the fact that in 2001, most of the NHS thought long waits didn't matter. It may be odd to think about that where we are now, but in 2001, it took 15 months of a government persuading the National Health Service that people waiting 18 months for their hips to be done was a problem. But why is it a problem? They just turn up. They're always there. It's always been that way. And so if you want to refocus something, as, as happened in 2001, it is a pretty relentless thing. And one of the things your report in 2022 did is it pointed out that this took place from the Prime Minister. There were monthly meetings. All the time I was there for six years, on one side of the table in the Department of Health and the other side of the table with the Prime Minister, there were monthly meetings where the progress, the date of progress on this refocusing has to happen. In those monthly meetings, it's not just the Prime Minister's Secretary of State, it's the Cabinet Secretary and the Permanent Secretary and the Civil Service recognise at this stage that those monthly meetings on four different aspects of policy, but one on, <coughs> uh, on waiting times, really mattered. Um, uh, and, uh, and so it took, as I suggested, 15 months to, re to make that refocus happen. Uh, and once it was there, the continuing focus, and this is a point throughout this, this report, on data, 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 uh, how do you, because the thing about being in Whitehall is there's a complete illusion that there is a delivery mechanism between Whitehall and an A&E doctor. There isn't, it's factual. And if you want a focus to have any, any impact, you need to first of all create a delivery relationship between all of those things. And at the moment, that's pretty fractured. So the focus has to, for me, start at the top and has to believe what are the mechanics of how that focus changes the way in which uh, an ICS makes a decision. That's the first thing. The second thing is financial <coughs> incentives. Uh, I, I was in 2002 working with Alan Wilburn when we created payment by result. The crucial thing, and again, your 2022 piece of work suggested that payment by results work. The idea in 2002 of paying organisations more if they did more work was thought of as really weird in the health service. It will never catch on. Perfectly normal and everything else, but in somehow it's morally wrong in the health service to pay organisations yeah. for doing more work if they get giving them more money for doing more work. Now, it's an established as fact. Most people think paying by results came across as a romance. It didn't. It was created by human beings and... What we can do now is if we want different results, the secret's in the name. We pay for different results. 
if we want people to, to not go into hospital, that's what we pay for. So payment by results is a good idea. We need to change the results and then change the payment mechanism. And at the, end, uh, at the beginning of March, the NSF CONFED has been working with five ICSEs <coughs> to construct, to look at how different payment mechanisms might get different results. Um, that comes out of the Hewlett report from last year. So we are, we are going to look at what both, and what would a payment by results system look like? And I, I, again, this comes back to a mechanic for me. What would it look like if we wanted to change, if, we want, if one of the results was people not going into hospital? What would that payment system look like? Uh, and, and that exists in other parts of the world. How would we make that happen? So the second thing is finding, finding a, a financial mechanic. Uh, the third is performance management. Um, I think, actually, if we had a crowd of GPs in the room and we suggested the way to make a change happen is to move the current awful performance <coughs> management of hospitals and GPs, they'd leave. Because the notion that that in any way brings about change, my current slogan about the current system of performance management is it does lots of things, but what it doesn't do is manage performance. <laughs> uh, it really doesn't manage it in any way that improves it. It's a performative exercise uh, in which hundreds and hundreds of people worry hundreds and hundreds of other people about things that nothing happens about. Now, that's not performance management. And again, your 2022 report talks about what happened in 2001 to five or six, where the modernization agency would come along and say, let's see what we can do about these things. Uh, and every performance management discussion needs to be an improvement discussion, and every improvement discussion needs to be a performance management discussion. But that means, at the moment, we need to change the way performance management happens, rather than just simply refocus that onto, uh, onto the nature of uh, uh, moving care into the community. My last point um, is, again, from the 2022 report about what, what we did about bringing waiting time down, is the mantra at that time wasn't everyone needs to work harder, it was things needed to be reformed. Um, and there's a lot of this current report which makes that point. In the next five years, if we're going to move care into the community, there will not be another 10,000 GPs. There almost certainly won't be yeah. another 10,000 community nurses. I agree. So if, when we move into community, what does that mean? And let me give you a concrete example. I've been doing some work in the London Borough on creating integrated neighbourhood teams. So you add together all the workers, all the staff in primary care in a small London Borough, 960. And you think, right, how will we supplement that if we move care out of hospitals into the community? Very hard. In that same borough, there are 3,600 domiciliary care workers. What about allowing them to do some health care work? What about them doing healthcare monitoring with the aid of technology that at the moment isn't done? Uh, and so we have a workforce. It's just they're not seen as capable of carrying out healthcare. Um, uh, and, 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 and that we can start doing that tomorrow. Uh, uh, so if we're going to make this happen in the next five years, we'll need to reform the way in which primary and community care has been seen as the correct way of working. It needs to change in order to take that additional burden from hospitals, and that's going to need a, a, a reform in the nature of the service. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. That's fantastic. Um, Lord Bethel. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, and can I, can I start by just <coughs> paying tribute to Becky and the team for a phenomenal report? Um, we could literally uh, spend the morning talking about any paragraph in it. It is extremely deep, and as you said, extremely complicated and each point made in it, it is worthy of further um, uh, discovery. And I want to build very much on what Paul said because I do agree with him that mechanisms and delivery are absolutely critical. We need a path for getting this done. It doesn't exist at the moment. There is a lot of huffing and puffing. Performative has become one of those words that uh, people are using a bit too much at the moment, but that is exactly what is going on at the moment. It couldn't be uh, better. We, there's um, an enormous amount of rhetoric, but not a, lo a lot of action. And, th and that is, that is uh, very disappointing. And the answer is to get that bit of it right. Um, but I want to, to approach it actually from not from the push end of things, not from the top, but from the bottom, and talk a little bit about the pull element of it. Because I think that 
that Paul did allude to it, but I think for, for me this is um, a, a very, very important part of uh, trying to get the vision delivered. And what I mean by that is that the politics of this are not, not exactly what uh, we are led to expect. And I will just point out the very obvious point that I know everyone in this room is aware of, but it is sometimes lost in the discussion. And that is that patients themselves do not like going to hospital. Patients themselves do not regard hospitals as being amazing sanctuaries of wellness and good health. They regard them as very frightening, inconvenient to reach, and often places where they get lost. And, and the, the, the activity of going to hospitals is something that the patients themselves would prefer not to do in the very large uh, 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 proportion. We know this because in the, in the, uh, the pandemic, <laughs> people stopped going to hospital. I mean, they <laughs> just went on strike and uh, it took an enormous amount, including literally advertising on television, uh, to persuade uh, people to go uh, back to hospital. So this is a really uh, important uh, political <coughs> point because the political mentality, and I speak here as someone who uh, was a minister uh, during the 2019 election, the political mentality has been for a very long time, for at least 20 years, that the retail proposition on health is essentially more doctors, more hospitals. If a, if a party, a political party, goes into an election saying more doctors, more hospitals, they've kind of got it covered. And I will remind you, as it, uh, that in the 2019 hospital, that is literally what Boris Johnson did. He said 40 new hospitals, uh, 6 million more uh, GP appointments, 50,000 more nurses, and that worked really well. In terms of, if you look at any analysis of voter reaction to the health proposition uh, by the Conservative Party, it was a winning election strategy. Um, and I personally went up and down the country um, with a team uh, taking pictures in the car parks of hospitals with Conservative candidates saying, we will build or we will extend <coughs> your existing hospital. And in at least 100 constituencies, because each of the 40 hospitals probably does two constituencies, that was extremely successful indeed. But it has unraveled very quickly indeed, for all the obvious reasons. Why is it unraveled? Well, it's been very difficult to deliver those hospitals, and, and they're not being delivered really. Um, there's been a huge amount of competition between constituencies on who gets a hospital uh, and who doesn't. And it doesn't address uh, two thirds of the country that doesn't, isn't being touched by uh, these new hospitals. And those are often the, the uh, gaps in the system which uh, government and the NHS isn't reaching into anyway. In other words, that, that political retail proposition is totally broken. And I hope very much indeed that there are no politicians from any party who are thinking about going into the next election uh, with something similar. What does work and what the public are interested in is exactly what the report is addressing. They want to see uh, health brought much closer to their homes and to their communities, and they want to see it much more evenly spread around the country because there are places in the country that have very poor uh, uh, coverage uh, in, in their medicine at all. And again, we saw this in the, in, uh, the pandemic. I know that when it came to the uh, basic delivery of health, whether that was the treatment of illness, the delivery of the vaccine, or the testing of individuals, there was big parts of the country where we had to work extremely hard to reach into communities. We had a lot of money, so we were actually able to do it. So this is a, this is a organization on resource issue. It's not a, um, population issue. It's not that the consumers and the patients are resistant to engaging uh, with the healthcare system. It is that the healthcare system fails to turn up uh, when, the, when they're needed. And those two, those two um, demand signals that people, the voter wants, the voter patient taxpayer wants healthcare delivered on their doorstep in their community and that we need to fill the big gaps that there are uh, in the UK are the fundamental drivers uh, of change. And I think that this agenda should have much, much more confidence uh, about um, its vision because of those two reasons. Rather than being defensive, rather than feeling that the silverbacks amongst the senior consultants in the acute hospitals are going to be snotty about community care uh, and primary care, we should be really confident that this is the way that we will 
uh, deliver um, the propositions to the voter, patient, taxpayer that they demand and rebuild the relationships and trust and confidence that people in Britain uh, deserve to have uh, in their healthcare system. If we understand uh, that that's, that demand signal, that, that pulling from uh, the people who actually need and pay for our healthcare system, then I think that changes our mentality about the way we do this. And where there is a gap, uh, and I have struggled uh, to fill it, but I think it does exist, is to try to persuade our actual politicians that there is a retail proposition on the doorstep that says that doesn't say we are going to protect your decrepit old hospital or we are going to build a fancy new wing on your hospital. It says we are going to address the issue with dentistry, with the GP surgery, with the population community healthcare system, with diagnostic hubs, so that you can easily and access the healthcare system uh, that you need. Turning that into effective political rhetoric and into a retail proposition for voters uh, is incredibly important because once you do that, then, then a whole bunch of other things uh, in the Treasury, in Dentistry, in DH, and across the healthcare system becomes uh, much, much easier. Uh, and there is much more alignment in resource allocation uh, and in, uh, as Paul rightly pointed out, uh, the sort of performance type uh, uh, measuring and metrics side of things. If we don't do that, we're not able to align the politics, then I'm afraid this agenda won't go forward. And so that's, one of, that's the, my, my thought for it, is, is get the, the, the retail politics of this. Thank you. Very, very helpful and, and thoughtful. I'm going to pose a question to each of you, then come out to the audience, so please do get thinking of questions. Paul, if I could come to you first. Um, I mean, we, we, we're almost certainly in an election year. Um, what would you be saying to the next Prime Minister, uh, I suppose building on your mechanics point, but I suppose recognising the real politic of we can't just forget the waiting list, we can't forget the acute, but if we're trying to turn this tax home shift, very practically, what, what, what would your advice be? I think there's a there's an interesting uh, challenge both in this uh, in this report and in that question, because I believe the NHS can do two things at once. I mean, most people don't, interesting enough. When you suggest it can, most people don't. Um, and so I do believe it can con it can improve productivity within the current model and cut waiting time. I think you, you look at the extra money that's gone into suits and the fact it's flatlined output, that's bad. Right? Mm. So I think we can, in the term, in the next five years, improve productivity in the current system and in the current model. I think we can also change that model. Um, uh, and the change in the model will lead, as James has been talking about, will only work, and Matthew Taylor said this in the NHS context quite a lot, if there is a change in the covenant between the British people yes. and the NHS. And that is a, a big, large-scale thing. And one of the things that uh, um, uh, West Fleeting said at the Labour Conference last year is we will have a five-year plan. And that planning process would need to start quite soon after the election and would need to be genuinely involving <coughs> millions of people. Because if the, if the end of that plan is to do this sort of stuff, it will only work if what James has been talking about happens. Uh, and that is easier after an election when the NHS and government are there and to say, this is what we're going to do. Construction, so, so reconstructing the covenant with the British people is actually even slightly bigger, but this is what this is about. Um, uh, and so that will have to happen, and as was suggested in the report, ICS is doing what ICS is meant to do. Um, uh, at the same time, as so uh, in five years' time, the waiting list will be cut by a change in the nature of the model and an increase in productivity of the current model. Do you mind if I come in on that? Yes. I, I agree. I think in another way of thinking about it is, is that we have a stock <coughs> and a flow problem. Uh, the rhetoric... And, that, and really, the, the, ma the performance management is a lot around the stock. How do yeah. we manage the stock? And that's a classic business model, by the way. I mean, every, every business in the world <laughs> has to 
think about how they transform their current challenge to deal with the business they've got and also to introduce um, better performance. So, so I would be saying to the government, pivot from only talking about and only focusing on how you deal with the current stock of wastable and find yourself some space to also think about uh, how you manage the flow of uh, our increasingly poorly population. And um, there is political rhetoric that you can use on that. Things like vaccines and screenings and diagnostic hubs are the physical manifestation of the flow management proposition. And the public are really interested in these things. They really care about it. They don't, you know, for most, you know, most people aren't, aren't seriously ill and therefore they are more concerned about trying to have healthy lives for their children and, uh, and for their parents. And therefore engaging with that um, well, really <coughs> prevention agenda is something that politicians have been very reluctant to do this time they woke up and did it. And, and just a quick follow up, because I, I, I like the way you talk about the retail proposition. You've been very prominent in talking about prevention and more healthcare upstream. So how optimistic are you that, that that's going to flow through into the political dialogue this year and into manifestos? So I am optimistic, actually. And there's, recent, there's one thing that's happened that has really uh, catalyzed a change in thinking, and that has been the half million people who have dropped out of the workforce, a lot of whom because of they are essentially sick. Not all of them, but quite a lot of them. Now, that has meant that the economists at the Office Budget Responsibility, the HMP and the Bank of England, who really are the alphas that make resource allocation decisions in the country, have had an absolute shocker. And they have got sleepless nights, suddenly woken up to the idea that it is the underlying poor health of our country that is holding back uh, the productivity of our workforce. You bet it is. I mean, this is not a great shock to those of us in the health system. But they have been in denial about it for quite a long time. And the OBR's uh, fiscal sustainability report has now identified this as a key risk for us actually paying back our national debt. That's where you need the agenda to be. When people are talking in those terms, you'll suddenly get serious people at the top of government uh, thinking thoughtfully about, well, the flow problem as well as the stock problem. So I think that really has catalyzed a lot of uh, fresh thinking. Lovely. Thank you. Let's open it up to the room. If you could just, we've got roving mics, if you could just introduce yourselves. Um, and I think, hopefully there's lots of questions, there could be lots of hands up. Let's take three at a time and then we'll go to the panel. Gentleman here. Yeah, I'm David Walker and I'm chair of Oxford Health. Um, it's good to be back. I haven't been to an event, a uh, breakfast event at the King's Fund since Paul Corrigan was a young man, which is <laughs> a, a while ago. Only five years ago. Um, <laughs> Uh, to Becky, um, it takes two to tango. Um, what I didn't hear from you, but maybe in the report, and I apologise, I'll get to it, is the interlocutor. W w Paul used the analogy of sort of a, a meeting with GPs. GPs are a shoal of eels. Getting to talk to GPs, getting the articulation from GPs of their position, their advance into the model you're describing is incredibly difficult. <coughs> PCNs haven't worked. GP federations are a mess. We, I find it very, very hard to have an intelligent conversation with GPdom because GPs still remain locked, it seems, in a rather autarkic individualist model. The other part, and very briefly, is local government. Local government is in a mess. Uh, perhaps thanks to Lord Bethel's colleagues, l over the past 14 years, local government has fallen apart, even in the Shire counties. So finding local government, in Paul's example of the domiciliary care workers, that would depend upon GPs working with us, that would depend upon local government working with us because some of those social care workers are employed still by local government. And unless local government has the will and capacity to be a partner, your model would have some difficulties. Question mark. Thank you. Take another one down here and then Theo at the back. Um, Tom Hay. I used to be chair at West London NHS Trust. Before that, chair at West Middlesex. And before that, um, served on a health authority in the 90s. But in relation to what the question I'm about to ask, which is really directed initially at least at Becky, um, I was a an, an executive director of a company, little company called Medihome in the noughties that um, provided um, uh, an alternative to hospital admission and early support discharge um, to um, a number of very successful hospitals. And I remember one of my early clients was, um, uh, I think it was a young lady called Amanda Pritchard um, and materially, another one um, was a chap called Tim Briggs. Um, who, for those of you who aren't familiar with um, Tim, he's the kind of the 
um, the great high priest and get it right, fir get it right first time. Um, and in relation to the support we provided to um, uh, RMOH, um, where Tim Briggs was um, a great advocate for what we did, um, we learned some things about um, the financial um, uh, equation. And one of the things, the question I'm going to pose to Becky is actually whether we're giving up too easily on the, um, uh, the cost effectiveness um, option. Um, because the thing which was really critical about the service we provided at RNOH, which was primarily around addressing the needs of patients who contracted MRSA and couldn't go back in for their, um, uh, um, their sort of repeat hip um, work or whatever, um, was that um, if you were, um, went with the standard formulary for addressing um, MRSA, which was a four times daily um, infusion of um, antibiotics, um, you could, the, the numbers didn't stack up. Um, and it was driven by the fact that that was the cheap um, formulary. If, on the other hand, you went to a twice daily um, formulary, much more expensive in terms of the drug content, but suddenly the numbers switched round in terms of the cost effectiveness of sending someone out twice a day rather than four times a day. So, and there's a whole collection of things that we learned um, in the noughties about um, getting the, the total package right. And there's something about, um, to support all that great stuff that um, James was talking about, about how this really, you know, is great for patients and they get actually also get better faster or don't go downhill as fast if they're at home, is looking at the equation in the round, which involves some redesign of pathways. It involves redesign of the sh particular shape of care to reflect the fact that um, it, no, we, this is not going to fly unless we do get the financial numbers right. Regressively, um, <coughs> that is always going to be a, an important driver. Um, and I'm just wondering whether we're possibly in that your opening line giving up a bit too soon on it. On it. Um, and there's a bit real unhelpful article that Richard Byers wrote in I think in the BMJ about citing some work that said, look, this is you know, hospital at home is more expensive. No, it's not. It's a question of getting horses for courses and the right shape um, of, uh, of pack the package of care. Thank you very much. We'll just take one question at the back and then um, uh, we'll go to the panel. Thanks very much. Um, I'm currently the chief executive of the Nuffield Trust. Um, I say currently because I was before that an unusual species, the chief executive of a community health organization in Leeds for nine years. And I do think that one of the issues that you um, talk about, which is parity of steam between community and acute, is extremely um, important. I ran what was perceived as a very successful trust, and people often ask me, if wouldn't I like to move to the acute sector? Mm -hmm. Because clearly that would be in a step up in my career, um, which I resisted, and now at the Nuffield Trust, hopefully bringing that passion there. If I was um, advising the Prime Minister and the Secretary of State, I have to say, I would say, do not be photographed in front of a hospital for at least a year. Make sure that you only go to community clinics and you only go out and yep. sit in people's homes. Go nowhere near a hospital. That would uh, send a very easy and quick message. My, my two reflections. One, did you talk to universities um, as part of your stakeholder analysis? I can't remember if you did, so apologies. Um, because changing the way in which staff are trained right from the beginning to be enthusiastic, expect to work in the community, to see that as a step. I cannot tell you the number of times I was still dealing with people saying the messages you had, I can't come and work with you in the community, I have to go to the hospital first, or I will be de-skilled. My goodness, what a load of absolute rubbish. Um, the second thing is we do have levers that are already there um, in terms of some of the information that's collected. I'm very keen on the community urgent response target, which is already there. You need to just turn up and ask people about it, and you need to turn up and ask people about the community investment um, proposals, which were there in the long-term plan, which talked about the shift of money and needs to be monitored in exactly the same way as the Mental Health Investment Fund. So I'd be saying, you've got some tools already, you've got some levers, why don't you use them? Lovely, thank you. Right, to Becky first, we've had questions about um, uh, it takes two to tango yep. uh, GPs and also the, the state that local government's in, how, how, how is that likely to play out? Um, are we giving up too easily on the cost effectiveness, the, the money argument? Uh, what about training and what about existing commitments uh, to shift the money? Can we monitor more closely? Rather a lot in there. Right, yes. So on the point of engaging 
GPs. Um, it's something I very talk about a lot. Um, in m I mostly uh, work in primary care settings. Just because it's difficult doesn't mean we shouldn't work harder to do it. I've heard the same argument about engaging with patients in the public. It's really hard because there's just lots of them and they don't all agree with each other. That's mm -hmm. probably true of GPs, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. We've just got to do it differently. And I think the temptation that it's just so much easier to talk to trust chief execs because there's only 200 of them <laughs> is means that we don't listen. And I think the solution to that is about devolution. It's about allowing them to get on. We don't need to drive them. We don't need to tell them what to do. There's, there's, there are, of course, pockets of poor practice, but there's some amazing work out there that isn't enabled. Um, I'm, I'm going to bring my colleague Andy in in a minute because I suspect he's championed a bit to get hold of some of this stuff, uh, being a GP himself and an ex-CEO uh, of a CPG. Um, I think it is harder to engage GPs. I think there's some great examples of federations working really well and some examples where they're not. I think PCNs are not a, they're not probably the right vehicle, but working together at scale makes sense. But I think there is something about the mindset of large organizations being easier that we've got to think around that rather than thinking why is it why how can we replicate how we work with trust? I absolutely take your point about local authorities. We found that a lot in our in our work. We didn't we did involve social care. We tried very, very hard not to fall into the trap of just adding and social care to the end of every sentence. And uh, my colleagues here were very good at challenging us when we, they thought we were doing that. We thought very hard about it. This absolutely cannot happen without the reform of social care that's so desperately needed. And we, we're very clear that this cannot happen at all unless uh, local government is, is reformed well. On the money, I sort of think yes and no. I think overall, the evidence seems to suggest that um, we'll uncover a lot of unmet need, which is what will drive up some costs because we'll just be providing better care to people. I do think that when we try to shift a hospital model of care into the community, it is always more expensive. I think we, you're absolutely right. The point about we need to redesign the focus. So virtual wards might be an example of where we're just shifting a hospital model into the community, which isn't going to be cheaper. I do think that it's very hard to extract savings quickly because I think most of the savings are tied up in estate. And without being able to release that estate, as we did in uh, mental health services to an extent, it's very hard to see big shifts in savings. But I think on a smaller level, it's possible. And then on training, yes, we did talk to train providers around. We talked to the universities. But I, if that's all right, I'm going to just bring Andy in to respond to that one because he looked at this in a lot of detail. Um, and the parity of esteem. So key. the best quote that we have in the entire report from my view is somebody who talks about if, can you imagine in a hospital if the health care assistant in the ward only got paid for the time they were at somebody's bedside, didn't get t paid for the time that they took to walk between different beds, didn't get paid for their time to do training or to do the report writing. It would be ridiculous and yet that's exactly what happens in home care. We don't pay them for those bits. So it's <coughs> so different and I think that for me that was so powerful. Andy. Thank you. Um, Andy Brooks, one of the project teams. Just pick up on a few points there. In terms of the it takes two to tango, I wonder whether actually it's a group dance rather than a, a, a tango. So actually there's a wider set of practitioners out there, not just consultants and GPs, yeah. but social care and the voluntary sector. I agree it's, it's difficult and just as GPs need to think about how they kind of work together, how other trusts work very locally, I think it's important for, for all sides to, to come together there. Also, something about the different nature of care in a community, the relational, less transactional and technical, comes back to the measurement cycle and visibility. How do we kind of make sure that that gets in importance within those conversations? And then in terms of the, uh, the workforce and the training, Becky already mentioned about the, the, the senior leaders spending time having worked in community, uh, community settings, like uh, Athea is here today. Think about how professional bodies uh, can encourage training uh, um, to work in multidisciplinary teams, both in them, but also leading them, which would be uh, important to do. How managers and practitioners work together, uh, increasing the training in community settings, even making that compulsory as part of training programs that people have to spend time in community settings. And not just a sort of token gesture, Here's your two-week placement as part of our, you know, significant amounts of time to under understand that. And then also helping people with career paths in community settings so that there's a clear way that people can feel that they're valued and the status has increased over time. Lovely. Thank you. Paul or, or Lord Becker, do you want to come in briefly or should we take some more okay. questions? Okay. It, yeah. it seems to me, uh, to David Walker's point, that uh, he's right about 
Um, I mean, I've got long arms, so if there's a natural distribution with good to bad, uh, actually, with GPs, it goes much further than even my arms. <laughs> um, uh, and, and if we say we want to move the lot, it's very different in moving the front and the back. Um, uh, I'd be pretty certain that <coughs> there's people at the front <coughs> who'd want to change their model to do this sort of activity. I'd be pretty certain that the same is true of local government. Um, uh, again, a very long distribution. And I suspect if we were clever about it, we'd find locations where the GPs want to do it and local government wants to do it, and we could do it. Um, and so I think uh, allowing, I mean, first, you know, getting the front end of anything to move is permission. Um, and I think we need to do that. And we, that might be 20% of the country. Um, uh, so I think, you know, David's right. Well, on, on, on your point about the money, I think, you know, it may be true that this is not going to save a lot of money. However, if we go into this not thinking about the money, the whole of the NHS will fail. We have to go into this thinking about the money. We have to go into this, if it is a new and additional model, making sure that it doesn't bankrupt the NHS in the country. And to do that, to take the issue of uh, virtual, uh, virtual wards, at the end of the next five years, most ICSs should have an entire virtual hospital, an organisation which structures care in the community outside of the hospital, and is an entire... At the moment, it's sort of a hobby for hospitals, uh, and it needs to be a specialism of hospital at home where you can construct it, and that will save money. Um, uh, if, we do it, if we do it without thinking about the money, we cannot afford that in the next five to ten years. Um, uh, I think that um, this question of the money is a really, really important one. Uh, it won't save money within the healthcare system for sure, and I thought Becky put it very, very well. But we have to think about more than just the healthcare system. We have to think about the national finances. And the cost of someone being ill is really not their health care cost. You know, for most chronic diseases that stop people from working, their health care costs are quite small. There's not much you can do for most people. The cost is their lost productivity, the welfare bill, uh, and the loss of skills and, and, uh, and expertise to the, to the workforce. That is horrendous. So for the, for the half million people who have dropped out of the workforce in the last few years, uh, it's about £20 billion pounds in total, uh, of which only £4 billion is health care costs. The rest of it is... And welfare and productivity. So we need to. That's how the nation is seeing it. That's how the treasury and uh, uh, and the people who, who juggle the books see it. And that that thought is important because this conversation is 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 understandably, but but I'm afraid it's not correctly thinking through the lens of how is the evolution of the GP going to work, as though that was the defining principle of this of this uh, um, mission. It's much broader than that. And I think that the, I think the money thing can improve if we do it not just within a, a healthcare management process, but also think about the, what other parts of government need to be changing as well. Because this agenda is very, very much, is very closely related to improving other parts of the environment in which people live in. That's for their mental health, what's happening on the internet, what's happening for physical activity, what's happening in the junk food cycle. The, uh, the determinants of health and by that I mean the pollutants and the things that we can easily affect, are highly, highly connected to this agenda. And it's not probably correct to think of it only in the, in the isolation of healthcare. It's got to be linked up with trying to improve the conditions in which people live and the dirty air, Sarah, and, and all the uh, internet filth and the junk food that are in their lives. And if you can link those things up, and if we're thinking about the next government, that would be one of my key messages to the next government. Don't think of managing healthcare simply as in a mechanistic, closed box kind of way. Think of it holistically uh, in, in all of these terms, because that's certainly what the public wants. Thank you. Let's take some more questions. I can see a hand up about halfway back, and then just one behind, and then there's two here, so maybe we'll take, take a group of four. Thanks very much. Uh, Jesse Cunnett from the Point of Care Foundation. Um, I suppose one of the things that really strikes me is that care closer to home goes to the heart of what a human-centred health and care system should be. 
And I guess there's a number of things from all of what I've heard on the panel that are kind of striking a chord. There's something about being clear to define the rhetoric from the reality. There's something about the impact of that on people's trust and confidence. And I guess there's a final thing for me about that recontracting with the public. And I've been sort of reflecting on a sort of human story, really. Um, one, that, one that's fairly close to home, but it feels very apt. Um, and it just sort of brings it to life, I think. So my mum died of breast cancer in 2017. She wanted to die at home. The family came together to try to make that possible. The reality is the care that she needed in those last days wasn't actually available at home. So when complications emerged late in the evening after the daytime services had closed, <coughs> she couldn't get access to the care she needed. That was a nine-hour ambulance wait, a locum GP that travelled 25 miles who couldn't help. Actually, it was a really simple nursing intervention. She had a retained bladder, but the reality is she died in agony because of that. And I only share that because I just think it brings to life that if we don't really ground what we're doing in standing with and by the people who are experiencing care and design what comes next together and with them, I think we run the risk of getting carried away and trying to design things that are not ultimately in the interests of people. So I think it's just a cautionary note about how and why people really matter. Um, hi, so my name is Yasmin Razak. I'm a full-time GP and I run a training hub and I work in West London and that really resonates with the, the previous question um, and I think the report's essential um, and I think what really struck out f stood out for me was the, the evidence, the data um, of the community approach that we take and the, um, the essence of what primary care is, what primary care does, which is human relationships, which we can't measure um, as a KPI and so we're just... Um, looking at the wrong outcomes constantly, um, and we're current. I'm in, I'm in Northwest London, and the current plan, without patient consultation or without GP consultation, because I, I hear the voice that maybe GPs are hard to engage, and so it's been decided not to engage them. Um, is to actually remove <coughs> GPs from the front line now, um, and GPs will only deal with complex care and all of the ARS staff that we have trained and supervised and brought in to support our patients in a holistic manner will be also removed, but um, in, a, in, a, in a hub setting at scale, and a care coordinator will triage them but won't know the patient and won't be clinical, and um, our pharmacists and physios who aren't used to diagnostics that actually aren't trained for that will now have to do diagnoses, referrals, assessment, two-week waits, and refer back to us. So this is a whole-scale change of primary care happening in an ICS here and now. And we understand that we might be a demonstrator site before it goes national. So I think the on-the-ground reality of what's happening is so divorced from the official policies and the lines um, that we hear. Um, and without patient and public involvement, without asking people who do the job every day, we're really at risk, a current risk of actually breaking up our essential, um, what the essence is of the NHS, which is primary care. And we know 7% of consultation, 7% uh, of funding comes from 90% of consultations and activity. And uh, a question, I guess, is how do we utilize the, um, the think tank's amazing understanding, knowledge, um, evidences and everything that we know to actually influence what really happens in these ICSs and in some back office meeting in NHSE which has not been shared or documented and how do we really make that shift happen because it's critical it's happening now we are just about to lose primary care in northwest London. Thank you. Gosh, big, big question and um, we'll have another couple here and then we'll go to the panel. Um, hello, my name is Joyce Frederick. I'm the Director of Policy and Strategy at the Care Quality Commission. I'll be quick because I know we've talked about 9.45 and two of my points have been answered actually. This will not work without the reform of social care. And secondly, the health determinants, only about 30% of health outcomes are linked to health and social care and it's the other health determinants, housing, education, that make people well. Um, from my perspective, this report is very welcome I, I almost wish it was um, making people well, closer to home, rather than the focus on care being um, closer to home. But I had three points um, in terms of potential barriers. And the first uh, was about politicians, and, and you're absolutely right. If it's the focus of politicians, 
then that would filter down. But with the um, election cycle and everyone wanting to be different than the last incumbent government, this is about long-term planning, but it's always short-termism in terms of politics. So how do we get over that barrier? The second issue is the behavior change that's needed within the ICS systems themselves. You're absolutely right. We've got the structural organization, but it's about behavior change and trust to work in different ways, whether it be workforce or whether it be the budgets or whether it be the focus. You have to have those behavior change. And it happens well in places, but not in others. How do we speed up that um, improvement? And the third is um, the contracts with people who use services themselves. I think the last two questions are very articulate about having to involve people. I could have talked about the death of my father as well, um, and that being essential. But my second point might be, you're absolutely right, people do not want to go to hospital, but when they are very ill, they want to know that there's a hospital around the corner. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that, that is a, a <coughs> kind of one of the key issues for me. Thank you. Thank you. And then... Hi, Sarah Hazard. I work for the Charter Society of Physiotherapy and I co-chair the Community Rehab Alliance. And just want to thank Lord Bethel because I know quite some time ago in reference to rehab, you've said there's a long history of it being horribly overlooked. So, um, you know, for, for me, I mean, it's very clear, the here and now issue um, that will affect tomorrow is how, how do we get the Treasury to really encourage longer term funding. We're not short of pilots. The intermediate care framework itself has front runner sites and exemplars and pilots. How do we get that, that funding model right now so that we can get scale whilst we do some of the longer term um, shift as well? Thank you. Okay, I think I'll come to Becky first and then um, final comments from Lord Bethel and Paul. So we've had a few powerful interventions and questions about uh, human-centered services designed around people, making sure that we take into account what people want and feel and need. Um, a, a very powerful intervention about what's happening on the ground mm -hmm. right now in some parts of the country. And I think a, 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 an absolutely <coughs> direct challenge to us as a think tank and, mm -hmm. and others out there, what's our role in influencing yeah. the future. And then um, some really helpful questions and interventions about Politics is cyclical. We need a long-term vision implemented uh, with different financial decisions made. Uh, how are we going to uh, find a way for those two to sort of work alongside one another? Yes. I'm uh, sorry. I'll pick up the point about so um, the, the two human things around human-centered system listening to patients. I think that the, what Yasmin talked about, about um, uh, the, the kind of Hubble bump, I think that's because we're worrying about one thing, which is counting access. It's almost like the NHS reacts to being told there's a problem with GP access, let's solve the with problem with GP access by making it quicker. And actually, is that the right thing to do? What, what do patients want in North? You know, how, how do we get, it's complicated, it's really hard working in that way, it's messy, but it needs doing. And I think it's too easy sometimes, and I, I've seen it, it's such a challenge when you're trying to move things quickly, and I loathe the phrase scale and pace, but it happens all the time. Right? We need to do it. We need to do it quickly. We need to solve this problem. Here's a, here's a solution. Let's do this solution without necessarily thinking about whether that's the right thing to do or not. And I think we've tackled speed, but without thinking about what that will mean for quality. So I, I do think that um, I talk a lot about this, and I, I won't go on forever, but... Um, the infrastructure to support and really understand primary and community care in ICS is woeful. It, it disappeared after PCTs, if I'm really honest, because of the nature of the way commissioning changed in CCDs, because they were supposed to be at arm's length for a while, then they weren't, but w and they had to reduce management costs. ICSs are still having to take out 30% of their management costs. There just aren't the people there who really understand primary and community services, and they tend to focus on hospitals because that's where they're their focus is determined by national bodies and by politicians. So they, they put their resource, and there, there is a lack of understanding, I would say, in many parts of the country. There are some better than others. But actually, that infrastructure to really support and do this development work is lacking and is really needed. Um, oh, I think I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm, I'm in danger of finishing late the first breakfast event I yep. chaired, and I'll be in trouble if I do that. So final uh, brief comments, yes, Lord Bethel good. and then Paul. Thank you. Um, uh, so really, really provocative questions, and I'll try and wrap up. I'm going to steal one of 
Paul's comments, which is at the essence of winning the funding <coughs> argument, the accountability argument, and the political argument, which several people have brought up there, is, is winning the argument that a pivot towards primary community prevention will actually deliver an improved health for our nation. And that seems like a really obvious thing to say, but as Paul said 20, 30 years ago, it wasn't agreed that shortening waiting lists would actually improve the health of the country. And we now take it as a complete truism, but that was an argument that had to be won. And when it was won, there were policy consequences that became a lot easier to deliver. We have to win the argument that if we do change the way in which health is done and we get the healthcare closer to people's homes, places where they live, and also give it a wrapper of improving the environments in which people are living, then actually that has a long-term benefit, both to the health of the nation, the economy of the nation, and the long-term potential explosion in costs uh, on healthcare. Uh, and I agree with Claire that uh, that is a lot about status and confidence and swagger and believing in what we can do. A problem it is with, G with GPs is that we're not going to see, as Paul said, a big increase in the number of GPs. In fact, quite a lot of GPs don't want to be GPs anymore. So we are going to have to embrace new ways of doing things. And that anecdote from Northwest London I thought was so powerful. Good goodness. But what is the accountability? That is an unreconciled question to my mind. I don't know whether we should be electing the board of the ICSs in some kind of Californian-style plebiscite or what, but definitely there's an accountability gap here because you can't deliver good community services if you don't engage the communities uh, themselves. That's just a, a fact of life, and we're not doing that at the moment. And in terms of winning the argument with the Treasury, there is a belief problem. The Treasury have burnt their fingers because they believe that they put a lot of money into doctors and medicine over the last 20 years, and instead of the health of the nation improving, it's actually got worse. And they feel very jaded about that. They haven't been persuaded that a prevention community uh, primary care population health approach will actually deliver. But I do think because of what's happened uh, <coughs> recently with the workforce, it, it very is a way to go. And just to take that very last point, I think we now have an opportunity <coughs> because actually the nation and the leaders of the nation are worried about those 500,000 people. But we have to make it happen. It's no good saying, well, the health service will sort that out because actually it won't unless it sorts it out. And to do that, <coughs> there needs to be some system whereby rehabilitation actually re-ables it, um, rather than just does stuff, right? And, and the end result of that is people going back to work. So we need to construct a system which actually gets people back yeah. to work rather than just does stuff, right? Um, and I think we can. I really think we can. But that's a different sort of approach to providing services than we've been used to before. On, I, I think the accountability issue in, in, in the Northwest London example is, is crucial two ways. Accountable above, what, you know, what, what's politics doing about And accountable below, what, what's the public saying about that? Um, and, it is, uh, and the problem with the NHS is such a large organisation, it thinks it runs itself. And it isn't. It's a public service. And to do that, it's got to serve the public. Uh, and the last point from uh, the CQC, uh, two points. The... Uh, the CQ, you know, my long arms, the CQC is dealing with this end, right? It's dealing with the back end, and it needs to deal with it. And the numbers of GP practices that are not dealt with, but are actually seen as good, are be need to be wielded. Uh, uh, so, in fact, if, we, if we've got five different ways of dealing with that, that natural distribution, the CQC has got a very big role in it. And the very last point that you made about a long term. I think, you know, in 2000, we had a 10-year plan, and that was about the right. I think in 2024, five will need a 10-year plan. My caution about it is if it doesn't work, we're finished. Mm. So it's not, let's have another 10-year plan, but it's got to be a 10-year plan that does what we're talking about. Because if in 10 years' time we say, let's have another 10-year plan, we'll be talking to ourselves. There won't be an NHS. So it is the, the, the importance of that next 10-year plan. I agree it's got to be long-term. But if in four years' time it's not working, we've got to do something rather than just say, let's peter out the next six years. Thank you. And I'm going to turn that very last comment, um, well, uh, it, it, which is stark but is true, um, I, I suppose to, to try to end on an optimi optimistic note, which is this event is called 
making care closer to home a reality, nothing is impossible. And there is a great line or a quote from someone in the health system in the report that says, you know, of course we can do this if we overcome lots of the issues that have been discussed today and we absolutely put our minds to it. And I think the energy in the room, the questioning, the passion from lots of different parts of the system, I suppose, give, gives me hope that we can make this a reality. It isn't impossible, but it's going to take a lot of hard work and collective effort. Thank you all for coming and being part of uh, today's meeting. We would love to continue the conversation in various ways, and I think it's a good challenge. What, what, what's our part as, as, as the King's Fund in making this happen over the next few years alongside partners? I think the report authors may hang around for a bit, and, and, and hopefully our panellists won't be in too much of a rush. So if you didn't get to ask a question and you'd like to, please come up. Thank you for coming and hope to see you again soon. Thank you.